So, when it comes to messaging, something that liberals get wrong 100% of the time, and I was guilty of this myself, and it's something that I will be working on deliberately in my social media content, and to a greater or lesser degree, even this uh, stream. The problem is, my personality is what it is, but when it comes to messaging, you have to be emotional. You just have to be. What we are learning, especially as society continues to advance and progress, uh, politics uh, seems to be the one thing where nuance and discourse and discussion uh, is what is least important when it comes to making a decision or voting for somebody. Right? Supporting even a channel, right? Who are you more likely to watch? Somebody who talks like this, staring into the camera for three hours, or ignoring you for three hours, playing a game that isn't even on screen. Or somebody who's like, oh my god, guys, I can't wait to get into this game. We're going to be playing Age of Empires 2, and we're going for Viper's Throat. That's right, the Viper. Not limited Viper, the Viper, because we got this, right? We're going to go hype on this shit. Let's go. Obviously, you're going to go for the one with more energy, but that's not enough, right? Personality and energy is not nearly enough because AOC is fairly charismatic, but she is, doesn't have national charisma or national um, standing. Same thing with Jill Stein. Very. Oh my God. I can, team Team Jill Stein. If you don't know who that is, type in Jill Stein in Google. Hit enter. Look her up and support her. Okay. She's running for president, and she's probably our last best hope. Uh, buena tardes. Uh, bonus dias, uh, mea caliente, uh, viewer. Ah, uh, I don't know what viewer is in Spanish. Uh, and I was probably insulting on accident. Um, <laughs> I'll have to Google some stuff. Uh, all that to say, right? Like, there are people who are very charismatic and very, uh, policy-oriented, like myself. We are very good at the thing. But marketing, not necessarily so much. And messaging is even more difficult because you have to be consistent. And over a three-hour stream, obviously, we're not going to be messaging about politics for three hours. I don't know that Bernie Sanders or Obama could talk about something for three hours like that either. All that to say, getting slightly off topic, messaging is what's important. Messaging with emotion is what's most important. It's, I could sit here and talk about the need for universal health care. And I could talk about the nuances of uh, Medicare is already bought and paid for through the federal budget system, that our health care system uses uh, multipliers to determine costs based off of Medicare, no less. And that depending on the region, those multipliers can be up to a factor of 11, 12, 13, 20, 100. Uh, and others would only be a similar factor of like one or three or something smaller. Right? But uh, as soon as I open my mouth and stop to or start talking about the 10-point plan, the strategy, the numbers, the figures, everybody's eyes start glazing over, and that's that's the problem, right? Democrats, and especially, well, I shouldn't say Democrats and especially leftists. Democrats and leftists equally fail in this regard. Democrats talk about neoliberal policy, and then they gaslight you into supporting their candidate. That That's their modus operandi. They also say uh vote for blue no matter who which is kind of like the red vote red it or, or you're dead or something like that but with the liberals it just comes off worse it just comes off worse because it's disingenuous right they, they're it's more like they're talking down to you and that is an emotional thing Ugh, mommy and daddy are bitching at me yet again no thanks i'm gonna vote for not them uh but leftists are just as bad. They're like, you have to read Karl Marx. You have to talk about theory. If you don't know the theory, you can't talk to us. Blah, 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 blah. I'm smarter than you and we're better than you. And what do you think that's going to do to everyone that you encounter that isn't you or a fellow leftist who is a political junkie? I have never read Marx. I never intend to read Marx. I don't really care about the theory. I see the world around us, and I see the solutions to the problems, and we should be discussing them. The problem is discussing the problems from uh, the vantage point of, I have the answers. It's not emotional. So, what can Democrats and leftists 
and we're not conflating the two. Democrats are still very much so right wing. Leftists are leftists. They're actually on the left side of the Overton window, right? Um, yeah, that is a big problem. I've read the theory and it annoys me. Right, because it was written by old white men regardless of their intentions. Because if you read capitalist theory, it reads a lot like communism. A lot like communism. Except instead of the state owning industry, it's the private sector owning industry, but the idea is that it's still supposed to provide for the common good of man. If you read Adam Smith, you'll find that out. Of course, you'd have to read Adam Smith, or you'd have to read Karl Marx and the Communist Manifesto. Um, so the, uh, the idea here is, if you're going to talk about communism, right, then, then don't talk about communism, because emotionally, emotionally, everyone in America has been brainwashed to be triggered by two words, but three words. Communism, socialism, and unions. If you say those three words, triggered, end of story, discussion, done. And the psychology behind it is that if you have a preconceived notion of this idea and you react negatively to that idea, your brain rewards you with dopamine because you have literally been programmed to doing it. Likewise, if you defend your pre preconceived notion even though it might be wrong or bad or whatever else, it also gives you a dopamine hit. See where I'm going with this? So we can't talk about communism. We can't talk about socialism. Unions we can talk about. Uh, I think that's actually making a bit of a resurgence, but that's kind of not the point, right? Leftist groups are always infiltrated by corporate mercenaries, though. It's a huge problem. I honestly don't think they are. And I'm not disagreeing with you to disagree with you. It's because leftist messaging sucks ass that corporate mercenaries don't have to, right? When I ran for DNC chair, I had a 50-state Facebook group for each of the 50 states. Some of them had hundreds of members. Some of them only had a couple dozen. Each and every single one of them fell to the same wayside of poor messaging and then eventually less interaction because it was... Just the same people regurgitating their same nonsense, right? And if you look at Black Lives Matter, they weren't infiltrated by the Democratic Party. They were the Democratic Party. They were operated by, um, oh, Vote Blue? No. What's their, um, what's their stupid, um, fundraising thing? Blue, blue something. Doesn't really matter. It was owned by the DNC, so it was always infiltrated by corporate media. You look at Our Revolution, that was the Bernie Sanders campaign turned into a um, uh, a network of support for political uh, people to, to get outside of the system. And that was ran into the ground again because of poor messaging. The brand new 535, poor messaging. Uh, I mean... What, what, what's another one? Brand new Congress also fell to the wayside due to poor messaging. Uh, our, no, I already said that. Real progressives fell to the wayside again because of poor messaging. And then they became an MMT cult. Uh, correct the record turned into Share Blue. I thought Share Blue was... I don't know, something like that is their messaging thing, but... You, you get the Justice Democrats, they fell to the wayside. Why? Because of poor messaging. And the messaging is has always been for these organizations uh work with us and we will win because our messaging is better and then their messaging is you guys are stupid the republicans are bad vote for us and that's that's never going to work right if you're going to talk about your enemy to elevate yourself you have essentially marketed your enemy you have not presented your own merits but wait a second didn't you just say talking about your issues and the merits of your issues is wrong False. I did not say that. I said talking about your 10-point strategy and how you're going to save the world and how you need to read theory is the problem, not the issues itself. For instance, and um, uh, I am quoting, by the way, uh, speaking of psychology, the psychology of political messaging with Drew Weston, PhD, episode 208 of the American Psychological Association podcast. Um, and we'll go ahead and... Uh, post this link in chat so y'all can follow along. We're not going to listen to it. I, I prefer reading it uh, myself. It's easier for me to digest the information. Um, but here, I'm going to go straight to that. So, 
Uh, let's see. Kim Mills. Hold on. That's the interviewer. Okay, so for example, Weston, who's the doctor of psychology, who is saying, like, this is how you should actually be messaging. He's taking, for example, abortion. If, for example, on abortion, if you say to a, a, a suburban independent or suburban Republican voter, we say even to a lot of rural voters, as we learn in Kansas, where you'd get these bright red counties, where 40% 40, uh, 40 of people would say, no, I want the right to abortion. If in a polling question you ask people, do you believe in abortion? Well, in those suburban areas, you're going to get a mix of feelings. Well, you'll get more positive than negative. You'll get about two thirds of Americans who will say yes to that, that they will support abortion. And these are from Republicans. But if you asked, are you pro-life or pro-choice? People have split evenly between those two things for the last 25 years until the Dobbs decision. Well, if you look at that, you might think, well, those are really conflicting results. Two thirds of people say that they're for abortion or for the rights, yet under half say they're pro-choice. Well, instead of using language like pro-choice, which is pretty common, pro-life suggests no matter what, I believe that from the moment of conception, you're killing babies. And that's the position the right's now taking. And it's taking a really extreme version of that position. So why is it that people reject the language of pro-choice half the time when they believe in abortion rights? It's because Democrats and progressives are offering them a position that's not equally untenable to the right, but sounds untenable, which is anytime you feel like it, you can abort it. But the reality is most of us don't actually feel that way. And he goes on and on and on. The point being, if you talk about abortion, people can conceptualize what that is, right? And if you talk about the freedom to choose when you conceive, nobody's going to argue with that. And that's why the right uses things like patriotism, freedom, family, America, country, duty, honor, in their messaging. Because those words actually invoke the dopamine. I... He goes into like the science and the medicine of it. It's like the front part of your brain. And then the dopamine comes out through there. And it's like you can actually feel like the light and the energy, like some sort of sensation behind your eyes when you when you successfully defend or attack, right? Defend against an attack, defend your position or attack someone challenging your, you get that, that reaffirmation. So that's the psychology of it. And, and it, abortion was one that was uh, very well um, uh, stated here. Down here, it's there's a moral choice between two sides. And I would, and he says, I would urge Democrats to say, yeah, they believe that every rapist has the right to choose the mother of his child. We believe that every woman has the right to choose the father of hers. You see how not only just impactful that statement is, the Democrats can literally turn that pro-choice on its head. It's like, yeah, sure. We believe that every rapist can choose the mother of their child, which is like, holy crap. Perspective. Perspective. You're saying that rapists who are committing unspeakable crimes have the right to pick the mother of their children. It's like, no, no, no. That's terrible. That That's a terrible way of looking at it. And then they say, but we also believe that women have the right to choose the father of their children. And that's the difference, right? They're making it about the woman's rights, her freedoms to choose. The rapist is taking that choice away from women. And that, I wouldn't phrase it like that personally. I wouldn't say we believe that rapists have the right. We believe that rapists make the choice for women to bear their children. Whereas we believe that women have the right to choose the father of their children, right? When they feel comfortable to conceive. In that phrase alone, or those two sentences put together with this best better wording, is infinitely more evocative, thought-provoking, and gets the same point across pro-choice without saying pro-choice. Because pro-choice has been beaten into so many conservatives' heads, that, Americans in general, that if you're pro-choice, you believe in abortion 100% of the time, let's go to the abortion clinic for a party. When in reality, being pro-choice is the right for the woman to choose body autonomy. But even if you say body autonomy, a lot of people still don't understand that. Again, you have to also message to the lowest common denominator. And that isn't to say that people are stupid. It's that when you speak in technical terms, most people aren't hip to the technicality of the words. Again, if we were talking to an astrophysicist and they started talking about the posthumous of the uh, incidental influx variation a quotient of the uh, stratosphere versus the bending of the light across the uh, polar vortex of the whatever, everybody would be lost. Everybody would be lost unless you're an astrophysicist. So if we talk about body autonomy, 
but in the same breath say pro-choice, we lose the audience. If we say a woman should have the right to determine when she is ready to conceive and with whom, nobody's going to really argue with that. Some might, but overall not ever, not too many people would argue with that. I like calling the Republicans anti-choice or anti-abortion instead of pro-life. That's what they are anyway. Uh, but that goes counter, right? Because now you're forcing them into a defensive position. Again, with messaging, you don't want to attack your opponent. You want to convey your idea to an audience. Does that make sense? If you are fighting with somebody, you're not going to accomplish anything. You're not. You're literally not. In fact, you're only going to reinforce their beliefs. That's the psychology. That is literally the psychology. Is if your ideals are questioned and challenged, especially forcefully, you will only def double down on them and you'll get the positive reinforcement uh, chemical to, to support it. Which is why religious zealotry and, con and conservative zealism is so difficult to deprogram because you cannot deprogram it directly. You must do it indirectly. And that's what the psychology of messaging uh, goes into here. That's all as high I explained it to my pro-life family members. It is horrifying that rapists have more rights than women. Yeah, and that's and that's even worse, right? Because that also puts the power, once again, in the hands of man. Of literally men. Of masculine XY chromosome holders, right? Um, or presenters. The point being is if you say the words pro-life or pro-choice, or if you attack them as anti-this or anti-that, you are only creating a situation in which they will be defensive. Which is exactly what progressives do and exactly what Democrats do now. Don't get me wrong. It's not like conservatives uh, aren't attacking Democrats and progressives. They are. But they get off on it. Again, if you attack somebody based on your beliefs, it's a positive reinforcement. If somebody attacks you on your positive belief or your strongly held belief and you defend against it, it is also a positive reinforcement. Right? It's a double entendre. You can't, which is, again, the whole gish gallop and the uh, logical fallacies, right? It's why conservatives don't actually talk about the issues. They just spread a, a boatload of filth about lies, antagonize their, their debate opponent, and then move on to the next topic and repeat the process, and then they look like they've won. Instead, when you get attacked with, well, rapists and murderers and this, that, and the other, and women uh, killing babies and fetuses, it's like, you know, you make some very interesting points, Ben, but at the end of the day... My simple belief is that the women should have the right to choose who is the father of their child and that nobody else should be able to make that choice for them. And it deflates a lot of their arguments because you're not talking about abortion. You're not talking about, you know, using abortion as uh, birth control. You're talking about a woman's rights to choose what to do with her body, but from the context of the traditional familial mating system called marriage and having kids so again the psychology of it the messaging of it is completely flawed and we're seeing examples of it even in chat and i'm not calling anybody out i'm saying we have to deprogram ourselves like you have to consciously stop reacting this way and it's going to take time because it's very difficult it is very difficult and especially when you're on the spectrum you speak nuanced you use numbers you use facts you use statistics because it makes you feel good as a neurodiverse autistic guy i'm like mm, show me the numbers and i'm just like yes numbers spreadsheets let's go but the average person isn't like that uh let's see i'm referring to the politicians Okay, that's fine, but that doesn't help your point. If you're saying that on social media, it still won't help your point because anybody who reads that is going to immediately go to their camps. Yeah, exactly. They're not pro-life when it comes to sending us to war or taking care of children once they're born. Again, we understand that nuance. It's a, mat it's a matter of messaging that without using their own... Okay. How, else to ex how to better present this thought then? It's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. If we, as intellectuals, believe in the honor of combat, we will bring a knife to the fight, or just our fists. They don't care about that. They, they've brought a gun. All they care about is winning the fight. 
So the nuance of them not being pro-life is irrelevant. The, the nuance that they send our kids to war and don't care about the children after they're born is irrelevant. Because they've already won the battle of pro-life, of, of verbiage, of messaging. So if we're going to talk about anti-war, we can't say anti-war. If we can't talk about uh, children being abandoned once they have left the womb, then we have to talk about let's look into providing better facilities for our children. Nobody's really going to argue about that. Uh, well, our kids should have better meals in schools. There is arguments about that. Well, who's going to pay for it? Now we have to get into the messaging of taxation. Because now if you start saying, well, the rich should pay for it, or we should raise taxes on the wealthy, or corporations should uh, take better uh, ownership, right? Now you're playing once again into their hands. I don't have all of the messaging answers myself. I'm saying this is the conversations that we need to be having. These are the things we need to be thinking about. How to message meals in school as being necessary in a conservative, not even a conservative way, but in a way that is emotionally evocative. We can talk about children perform better in schools when they have breakfast and lunch. Instead of saying schools should be providing that, or that it's up to the parents who are poor to provide it, we can simply say, studies show, well, maybe you shouldn't do even the studies. It's like, we believe that, well, let's see. How would you phrase this? Um, we've seen that children perform better when they aren't hungry in school. Because when you're hungry, you get sleepy, and when you're sleepy, you're less attentive. If we want to raise uh, scores in schools on testing and whatever else, then we need to make sure that our kids are fed. And we should talk about ways to keep them fed. Well, how's that going to work? Well, there's any number of ways. Uh, we could take all of the uh, gambling money and start uh, putting it towards our schools. We could take the gas uh, tax money and put it towards our schools. Well... That's just, I don't have kids in school, so why should I care about your tax dollars? It's like, okay, why should I care about your Medicare then, right? Now you're being combative, of course. So, again, with messaging, I don't have all the answers. He didn't have all the answers in that particular uh, article either, or podcast. Um, I'm just saying, these are the things we have to think about. And as a candidate, as a politician who wants to be sitting in this office, for realsies, this, these are the thoughts I'm going to have to have, too, is coming up with nuanced ways to evoke the emotional discourse about the key issues that matter to us. Claiming the sky is falling and all this other crap is just simply not going to work.